Back in fall of 2017, I was recommended a game by one of my friends. He said it was pretty good, so I looked into it. I ended up playing the first chapter on my own, and I was genuinely scared. The atmosphere of the game and its world terrified me and left me wanting more. So I stayed up to date. Watched someone else play chapter 2, and then chapter 3 when it was released. I thought it was great at the time, the world, the characters, and the mystery of the story. I followed the game throughout the months to its completion, but at the end of it, I couldn't shake this feeling of emptiness that the ending of the game brought me. Was it just me? I had loved this game, why did it feel so empty? What happened to the story, the mystery, the characters? Was I missing something? Over the next few months, I slowly grew a distaste for it. Something with it just didn't feel right. It felt so unfinished, so... And polished. Eventually that distaste turned into dislike, and then it morphed into disappointment. Then, at the end of it all, it turned into a desire to discuss that disappointment, which is why I'm here today. Hello, I'm Alan, and today I'm going to be breaking down in painful detail as to what makes Bendy and the Ink Machine a total disappointment. I'll be breaking down the overarching problems and how these affect the individual chapters. In this video I won't be getting into the controversy surrounding the company, this is purely about Bendy and the Ink Machine as a game. And not any other games either, no Dark Survivals or Revivals, at least today. If you're interested in learning more about the company behind the game, there's a fantastic video by Chris Portal documenting everything. So let's get into it. If you don't know, Bendy and the Ink Machine is an indie horror game made by the Meatly Games. Wait, scratch that. Kindly Beast? No. Joey True Studios? Why would you name your real studio after a failed fiction one? Anyways, the game was led by two people at the beginning. The Meatly and Mike Mead, but grew to a small team by the end of production. It released chapter by chapter throughout 2017 and 2018, with a total of 5 chapters. Garnering the attention of popular YouTubers, it became a pretty big success among indie games. It even had a few cameos from popular YouTubers in the game, with Will of DA Games as Grant Cohen, to him, always big stuff coming. and Jacksepticeye as, well, himself. The game had merchandise as early as Chapter 3, and a console released on the same day as Chapter 5's release. The complete and finished game will launch on the Nintendo Switch, Xbox One, and PlayStation 4 in October. Huh? Oh, uh, sorry, a console release a month after Chapter 5's release. Despite that, the overall game was successful, and it seems to have a positive reception on many sites. And I can't wrap my head around why. The presentation of Bendy and the Ink Machine is always a topic when discussing the game. Most people, even if they don't like the game, agree that the art style works well. However, in my opinion at least, while the concept of the art style is great, the execution of it is very flawed. I feel like the major thing that makes the whole art style fall apart is laziness combined with the ambition of the environment. In later chapters, as the scale of the game gets bigger, it becomes increasingly difficult to make an environment look good. It's not too difficult to make a small room look full, but a large cave is a different story. This doesn't feel like a lived in town, it looks flat. If the execution of a large area isn't executed well, it feels cheap and takes you out of the immersion of the game. This issue of scale becomes more pronounced as the chapters progress. This doesn't mean the earlier chapters aren't flawed visually as well, there's a serious issue of reusing assets throughout the entire game, but it's especially pronounced in the first couple of chapters. Reusing assets isn't an issue in video games most of the time, while some can see it as lazy, it's actually smart if you use it correctly. However, Bendy does not use it well. This is a board from the game, pretty simple, good asset, but this single board as well as its texture is extremely overused. And I don't just mean there's a lot of boards lying around, no, I mean it's integrated into things it shouldn't be. Need a railing? Stretch that board out. Need some arch detail? Shrink that board. There are so many examples of this single model being used throughout the entire game, and that's just one of the many examples of overusing assets. Repeating textures is also an important thing to have in a video game. You don't want to spend time making each floor completely unique, so using a texture that repeats itself is a good way of saving time. But the most important part of a repeating texture is making it subtle. Bendy utterly fails in this. Not only do the textures not line up properly, but you can easily tell that it's a repeating texture mainly due to this plank. If you want to have variety in the floor, don't make it part of the repeating texture. Otherwise, it will do the opposite of giving variety. It will bring more attention to the repeating floors. This might seem like nitpicking, but stuff like this can actively take you out of the experience and make it seem cheaper, which it is. Bendy and the Ink Machine's presentation suffers from a term called Death by a Thousand Cuts. There aren't many problems on the surface of the presentation, but once you look closer, there are so many small problems. And most of these can just be written off as nitpicking, but at a certain point, it becomes a bigger issue. It begins to show incompetence rather than mistakes. 
But there are some bigger problems as well. I think the biggest issue in the game is the atmosphere. The atmosphere of a horror game is one of the most important things to get right, and walking the line between boring and creepy is a very difficult thing to get right, and Bendy almost did it. Briefly, I'd like to take this game back to its first iteration of its first chapter. On the left is the original release, and on the right is the full release. Now, from a technical standpoint, the full release is better looking, right? But I feel as the chapter got improved, it fumbled a big part of what made the original chapter 1 work in the first place, which is the atmosphere. The original chapter 1 did a fantastic job of making you feel trapped and claustrophobic with low ceilings, not good visibility, and more still environments. It made it feel a lot more creepy. With the new chapter 1, while it's still the same layout, and on paper the same chapter, it feels completely different. The ceilings are higher, some rooms are just bigger in general, and the new lighting being so bright makes everything have less of an impact. So yes, this reveal of the ink machine is more grand and impressive. However, the old way of it just fading in from the darkness left more of an impact horror-wise. It's just right in front of you. The thing that started everything is something you can touch. The new reveal makes you feel a certain barrier between you and the machine, both through distance and a literal barrier separating it from you. This doesn't seem like much of a deal, but in the original chapter, the idea that something can just pop out of the machine at any point was scary. But with the new one, that effect is kind of lost due to the physical distance of the machine. If something popped out of it, you could just get away. The way chapter 1 evolved just made it feel more bloated and less unique. I think the idea of a workshop getting increasingly dirtier as you go further into it is great, but then they go back and add a dirt floor to the first chapter. The direction of the art feels like it's driven more by what the creators think would be cool, rather than what would work well for the game. Like, yes, the Dart minigame adds something, but is it really necessary? As the game went on, it just lost more and more of what made it creepy in the first place. And this issue plagues all of the early chapters of the game. Chapter 2 got an unnecessary expansion, and now there's a pool table. And chapter 3 is where the problem started with it not being focused on atmosphere, but rather more grand set pieces, but without the detail that would be required for them to work as said set pieces. You can't just slap a PNG of Bendy that's everywhere else on a giant wall and call it good. Chapter 3 in general is plagued with other presentation issues as well, such as this beautiful transition into a lighter room. You shouldn't just turn the light level filter down, just make the area actually dark, please. There's also points in the chapter that just halts everything to make you watch something happen. The first one isn't that bad considering it's a character introduction, but they do make you listen to about a minute of them singing and then talking to you. Well, you get to look at a black screen or a dark room. Then there's a section where you get to watch them talk for a minute and 40 seconds, all for some exposition. And this one doesn't have an excuse, considering she talks on the intercom throughout the entire chapter. I get that they wanted her to have more screen time, but why not just have her being the one that gives you the weapons in between missions? Anyways, point being that these halt the chapter in its tracks and don't add enough to warrant it. Chapter 4 is slightly better in presentation than 3, but not by much. I think some set pieces work alright, but others not so much. Was this really necessary as a room for a map plan? The vent scenes also aren't great, it's just holding forward with a single super obvious jump scare in it. I like these guys, but they don't do anything with them or this robot. They really just went and set up the most obvious place for a weeping angel and then didn't use it. They literally say it moves when you don't see it. It almost feels unfinished. This boss fight also isn't great, same issue that I had with chapter 1 being that bigger set pieces don't make it better, but at least this has an excuse I guess. I'll come back to this guy in the gameplay section. The death of the projectionist is okay in concept, but the animation isn't great for it. And why does he not steal the head, considering in chapter 5 his throne room has a bunch of projectors on it? It's almost as if they thought it would be cool and had no actual reason for it happening or something. Also gotta love that you can tell when the projectionist is teleported for the cutscene, again looping back to the death by a thousand cuts. And then the presentation in chapter 5 takes a noticeable step down from chapter 4 in both terms of polish and actually good looking locations. The whole cave aesthetic the chapter goes for does not work well with the art style, makes everything feel pretty barren. Ironically the best parts of the chapter are the rooms that are the smallest, which means that the final boss room is not one of the highlights, not to mention the hell maze of whatever this is. Nothing really feels tied together. There isn't one giant issue, but a lot of small ones, as I've been saying. Actually, let's discuss that further to end off the section, shall we? Let's go chapter by chapter and pull apart all the small cuts that make the game feel cheaper. I will admit, a lot of this is pretty nitpicky, but hey, this is me getting it out of my system now so I can focus less on it going forward. And I still think it's a pretty big part of why Bendy feels pretty cheap overall. So let's go!
starting with chapter 1, why are the signs 2D? Why does this paper go behind the board, and why is there so much blank paper on the walls in the first place? And why is this paper not connected properly to the wall? Why do you cast no shadow in the projector? Why is Henry so goddamn so annoying? The head on the cutouts is floating! Physics? What's that?! Why are these plants here? And how are they alive? There's no variety in the slashes the axe makes. There's no collision detection for the planks making them look like complete garbage. And now chapter 2. Why can you put axe marks in the candle lights? Why is there only one type of music sheet in this entire music department? Why is the audio log's name here messed up? Why is there a toilet in a supply closet that's also above a summoning circle? This just isn't how lights work. How is this piece of paper not completely covered in ink? Why is the old design of the ink machine on this blueprint just all of Sammy's animations? Why do these supports look so bad? How does Bendy somehow break these planks by just appearing? Why does this barrier look so bad? Why is the collision on this barrel not oriented correctly? Alright, chapter 3. This is where it starts to get long. Why do these clothes have no collision? Why does this mirror not reflect us? Why does this ink texture float on the water? Or ink? Whatever. Why can you only open this box once you've talked to Boris? Why does the chest clip into the bookshelf? How are only the top of the planks on this chair covered in ink, but not the sides of it? Why are the ink textures on these stairs floating underneath it? Despite glass being shattered, there's no glass on the floor at all. Why is this projector just a matte black rather than having an ink texture on it? Why does the statue's ink texture have a sudden cutoff? Why is there just a hole in this wall? How does Boris know when to flip the switch? Henry never calls out to him. Why are the hands on the sign not only in the default pose, but also clipping through the sign itself? Why are all the dead Borises in the exact same pose? Why is this one literally in a T pose? What the hell is going on with this texture? How is this plush being held up by cobwebs? How, how strong are these spiders? Uh, I'm scared. Why are these guys so loud? Why... Why is this sink made out of wood? Why is this ink texture not aligned with the railing? Why is this projector flashing if it's only showing a single image? Why is Boris's arm clipping through his snout and face? Why, while Boris is visibly shaking you, does your camera stay completely still? Alright, chapter 4, baby! Why is the ink written on the wall so obviously just a large chunk that was copied over and over? Why is this the only interactable box in the game, and why is it so light? Why are these two cutouts in the wall? How did this happen? And why is this chest in the floor? Why does this camera move only have two keyframes? Why is this statue clipping into the wall? Why is this arm's hand in the default position? Why can't you walk here? There's more than enough space. Pendy's walk here looks really dumb. Oh boy, that clipping on Boris's hand. And once again, the two keyframe camera move. Finally, chapter 5. Oh god, the two keyframe camera move is already back. That hand is going through that plank. Oh, there it goes again. I can't really put my finger on why, but this whole section just looks bad. Why is there light peeking through the ceiling? Okay, I have no way of proving this, but I swear his mask gets smaller when it falls off. Right? Tom's axe just kind of spawns in there. Holy hell, that fall is way too fast. My man went from still to terminal velocity in less than a second. Why can you walk through these gears? Why are these gears so clearly just clipping through the wall? The camera movement in this part in general is just bad. I mean, look at this. Oh, and the two keyframe camera move returns one last time for a goodbye. This is just so obviously a gif. Okay, that's enough. And with that over with, we are finally done with the first part of this video. There's a lot more ground to cover, so I suppose let's hop right into the next section. The gameplay of Bendy the Ink Machine is fundamentally flawed for what it was trying to achieve, both in combat and movement, as well as everything in between. It's broken right at its core, so let's start with the movement system in the game. Actually, in the original Chapter 1 it was fine, it worked alright. It had some jankiness to it, but it worked for what it was. Then, upon the full release, it's the same system, but it's far, far worse. Why is this? It actually has nothing to do with the movement system itself, it has to do with the game's direction. Now, when Chapter 1 first released, it was meant to be an atmospheric, slow-paced, story-based horror game. But by Chapter 5, Bendy had changed a lot. It had morphed into this action-adventure, almost mystery game with combat and big set pieces. 
But with this fundamental change to the game's direction, they never revamped the movement system of the Atmosphere Core game, and that system is not built for the newer direction the game tried to go in. It's slow and not made for combat, but by Chapter 5 you're having to traverse large areas and do large-scale combat while your walking speed is barely any slower than your running speed. It makes everything in the game feel really sluggish. Why not adjust these issues so that you can actually play the game well? During Chapter 5, there's this fight against Sammy Lawrence, but you barely get to see him because you're just running in circles around him until you get enough distance to hit him without taking damage. The movement in combat doesn't feel good. Speaking of, the combat was added back when Chapter 2 was released, and it wasn't good back then, but it didn't suffer as much from the jankiness because it was mainly used to break boards and kill only a few enemies. But this bad combat system was never updated, and as more and more combat was included with each chapter, the combat mechanics suffered more and more. So now that you can see the fundamental problems with the movement system, let's keep that in mind as we discuss how they impact each chapter, as well as the other issues in gameplay chapter by chapter. Starting with Chapter 1. Only one thing of real note happens in this chapter, which is that the ink machine is activated creating ink bendy, presumably. Other than that, it's just a filler fetch quest. Now, if the fetch quest had actual lore relevance, I'd be fine with it. Some games can make fetch quests bearable or even fun with good level design or good story elements, but somehow Bendy manages to fall flat on both accounts. The level is horribly designed and you're constantly going back to the same spots over and over again with no variety, and due to the lack of atmosphere it really emphasizes the slowness and makes the chapter really boring in the process. There are a ton of doors which could be used for more rooms and variety, but even being generous, only 7 of the 21 doors can open. Yes, I counted. The chapter goes as follows. You pull up the ink machine by putting two batteries into a generator, a door opens, and you can go find a room with six pedestals, each one having a different picture above them. You then have to find the six separate items throughout the entire map and bring them back to the pedestals. You pass by the same areas and go down the same hallways multiple times just to get all six. Now, while this is tedious already, you then have to go back across the studio again to activate a valve. Why? Not a reason. Just to pad out time. Then once you pull the lever, you have to go back to the pedestal room, activate the lever, and you're finally done with the fetch quest. And now that you're done with all of that, you go back to the ink machine room, there's an unscary jump scare, and you're thrown into a chase scene! Finally something interesting with stakes! Just kidding, you can literally stand there forever and nothing will happen. The ink even stops rising. This could have been a great place for a chase scene, and it tries to be one without actually having a thing chase you. Good job, guys. After the chase scene, you fall down further into the studio and you have to do the engaging task of draining ink three times. How is the ink that was forming above not filling this entire downstairs area with ink? I have no idea. The ink in this game in general makes no sense. Sometimes it's flowing and see-through, sometimes it's pitch black. Speaking of pitch black, when you're draining the ink, shouldn't the walls be covered in ink? But nope, apparently ink is basically water in this world. Once you finish with that engaging task, you get access to an axe. Ooh, maybe we'll actually have some combat or something to finally spice up the gameplay. Oh, this room looks like it could be used for a fight or something spooky. Let's see what happens. Oh man, the room's shaking. What could it be? Oh. Oh. Uh, the chapter's over. I see. Chapter 1's gameplay, while not being nearly as flawed as the other chapters, still suffers from the change of direction. Because the game isn't as atmospheric anymore, it isn't nearly as tense as the original chapter, so it just becomes boring. While it is probably the least flawed chapter in terms of gameplay, it's probably one of the ones I would least like to play. It's just boring. The only saving grace is that it's short. The most enjoyment I could get out of this would be pointing out the small nitpicks, like how this plank is 3D and the others are 2D, or how this paper just doesn't make sense. But aside from that, it's just a walking simulator with a couple of small set pieces that put the player in no danger. But there's darts! Oh hell yeah! Moving on to chapter 2, things get slightly more interesting. Not better, just more interesting. The first part of the chapter is just some walking until you reach this hallway where you're introduced to a new character, Sammy Lawrence. You try and follow him only to find out that he's teleported! Don't ask if this ever comes back into play because it does not. Then oh joy, you have to backtrack to flip three switches! This means that you have to go through this inky tunnel a total of three times and that's just fantastic! I mean at least with chapter one the fetch quest probably at least had a couple of rooms that you hadn't seen before, but this is literally just one room. There isn't any new things you get from going back through it other than your gameplay time being extended. Once you trudge through the ink a third time, you're finally able to open a door that leads to a bunch of planks you need to break. What? What was the point of the door if you are just gonna block it with planks? You enter the stairwell that's covered with ink. Henry for some reason thinks that this is the way to go, so he has to drain it. Upon flipping the switch, the lights turn on in the studio. Then you're faced with your first taste of combat, and holy god is it horrible. 
and due to the range of the enemies and the range of your own weapon and the horrible hitbox, it is almost impossible to not get hit while dealing with them. There's no flow in the combat, it's just swing, back off, then swing again and hope not to get hit while doing this because there's no skill involved in any of this. Not to mention the animations for the axe do not feel impactful at all and they look so stiff, it just adds to how bad the combat feels. In terms of this specific combat encounter, it can't even get spawning in enemies right. There are a total of 5 seekers, which is what they're called for some reason, in this small room, but you have to walk up to them to trigger them to spawn. Now this works well for the first batch, but once you've dealt with all that had spawned, there's still likely one or two more still waiting for you to trigger their spawn animation. This wouldn't be a huge deal, but the only way to progress is to kill all of them. And if you don't know how this works, then you're going to be stuck in this room until you wander into the last one or two you need randomly. The most simple solution to this is just to make it so that you don't need to kill them to progress. That way if you deal with all the enemies that spawn, you can just continue. Then when you go back into that room later on, you can run into the ones that you didn't trigger. It would add a bit more depth to this, but nope, they just make it stupid. Anyways, after you defeat the enemies, some doors open and you can walk around this area freely. Once you get to this room, you can see the pump switch for the door that you need to get to. Great! Ah, shit. Well, now we need to stop this pump as well. From this tape, we can tell that we need to open this closet, but to do that, we need a key. So get your walking shoes on, because it's time for some more backtracking to look in garbage cans. This is not fun. Once you find the key and get back to the closet, you listen to another tape, which tells you an order of instruments. The drum, the violin, and the bass. The drum. That's probably important. So with this information, you go into the large recording studio and play the instruments. Then of course nothing happens because you needed to turn on the projector, dumbass. Once you do that, then go back down and do the puzzle again, you can finally enter a room that has a valve. Crank that sucker and boom! But also here's like 10 of those enemies from earlier, have fun dealing with the bad combat again! You can now enter the office. <laughs> just kidding, that would be too easy. You can now enter the infirmary. There's a valve to pull, presumably the one that will finally let you enter the damn office, but oh joy it's missing. Hope you're a fan of the ink tunnel from earlier because here's even more of that. Kill this guy with a box and finally make your way back up. Pull the valve, go into the office, flip the switch, and finally, after all of that, you get knocked out. Good god, that was tedious. So, to recap, you need to get through this door, but to do that you need to flip this switch, but to flip that switch you need to turn this valve, but to even get that valve you need to kill a guy, but to even get to that guy you need to drain the place the valve is in, so you need to turn this valve, but to turn that valve you need to play some instruments, but you need the order of the instruments so you need to listen to this tape, but to listen to that tape you need a key, and to get that key you need to look in trash cans, and to find out that you even need the key in the first place you need to listen to this tape. This is way too convoluted and you don't even get a payoff. Sammy could literally knock you out as soon as you enter this area, and nothing would change. Hell, why not open the chapter with Sammy already having captured you considering that you blacked out at the end of chapter one? For literally no reason. This entire area is pointless filler fetch quest disguised as puzzles. It's completely pointless. But hey, at least there's a pool table. The ending of this chapter is probably the best thing we've seen from the game so far, which may I make clear is not saying much, but this begins after Sammy has tied you up. You listen to him talk for a bit until he walks out and attempts to summon Bendy to kill you, but ends up just killing himself with Bendy instead. Then we can somehow get out of our restraints and oh boy, more combat. This section has blaring intense music playing for most of it for some reason, as if it was a chase scene, but it isn't one. Oh man, there's the ink machine to remind us that this is indeed Bendy and the Ink Machine, and conveniently our axe breaks. You know, this axe probably could have been completely removed from this chapter if they just removed some boards and didn't have shitty combat sections. Regardless, we press on and oh man, there he is, it's Bendy and holy shit, he can actually kill you this time! Revolutionary! In this chase scene, you must hold Shift and W and run your way to victory. I say run, but come on Henry, can you go any faster? Good god, you're slow! Other than that, it's okay, nothing great. I mean, you barely see Bendy, but it could have been worse. The chase scene ends with a door being blocked by a... Uh... Oh man, it's the plank again. Huh. Oh, wacky. Then the chapter finally ends with Boris coming out from behind a wall. That was, uh, pretty rough. I think the second half of the chapter is pretty okay, and with some tweaking could even be good, but the first half of the chapter is 
awful and incredibly tedious. Now on to chapter 3, I guess. If you thought the first two chapters were bad in terms of fetch quests, oh boy do I have a chapter for you. This chapter begins in what I assume is Boris's house. Hell yeah, two toilets. The chapter begins by giving you a fetch quest. You have to get soup for Boris, which by the way, he doesn't even eat. Oh man, that's a freaky thing. I hope it actually means something. After that, you can leave and you get this flashlight. This section would be pretty neat if it wasn't for the fact that you have to constantly keep your light on Boris, who is moving so goddamn slow. It doesn't help that you're also going slow yourself. Once you leave and pass by this awful transition from darkness, Boris leaves through a vent and opens the door for you. Will he come back out? Stupid question. Moving into the room, it's our first example of Bendy trying to make itself seem more grand in scale with this giant toy shop. I actually don't really know what the purpose of this room is other than to look cool. It almost looks like a lobby, but it leads to a small room for toy making, so I don't think it is. Anyways, this isn't actually the worst thing, it does get across the grand scale and is fairly detailed, apart from this large PNG of Bendy that they slapped here because god forbid that they have a blank wall or <gasps> make new textures. Moving along, we do have an honestly poorly designed puzzle. It's kind of confusing as to what you have to do. It's not hard, but it's just kind of poorly designed. Once you solve that puzzle, you move into a cutscene room where you'll remain there for a good amount of time, some of it spent in complete darkness. Epic. Waking up from that complete darkness, we're given one of the few choices we can make in the game. What does the choice do? You get a different audio tape to listen to. Pretty much nothing else changes. The past merge back together within one room. Very cool. We get a pipe from Boris, no, not that kind of pipe, and we go through a room full of marketable plushies. Ah, closed door, great, time to open it. And Boris gets to stay with the lever right next to the door! Not cool, Boris. So, we must go pull the other one at the same time so the door opens. We go down these hallways, get probably the best jump scare in the game, which isn't saying much, but it made me jump the first time I played it, which is more than I could say about literally every other jump scare. Beat the shit out of this thing, pull the lever, and we continue on through the open door. So, we enter this room, which leads to an elevator, but more importantly, the bathrooms. Ah yes, the two genders. Going down the elevator, we get some monologuing from Alice, and then we get to go see her again. Oh joy. Look at Boris go! Wonder where he's going. Oh. Oh god. This is horrifying. This guy is T-posed. This room is just kind of dumb looking and not very scary to be honest. Moving through it, we can go down this hall and see the angel herself. Guess what time it is? Time to listen to more exposition! While we get to do nothing! Yay. Now we are her- As if there weren't enough fetch quests in this game already. We return to our elevator where our companion Boris is waiting for us, which will become a running theme because he never leaves this elevator again for the remainder of the chapter. What a great companion. First stop on our fetch quest list is level K. Ready to backtrack through an area we've already been in? It's really weird to me that the first thing Alice has you do is go back to a place that we've already been. There are a bunch of other floors the player hasn't been to yet, so why start off with a floor that we've already explored? Anyways, we have to get gears, so beat up the guy, open these panels with a wrench Alice gave us, and bada bing, bada boom, back to Alice. I'd like to quickly mention here that a big selling point of this chapter was the many weapons it introduced. Dozens of new hand-drawn textures, four new weapons, new hiding and stealth mechanics. But all of these weapons function literally the exact same. The only difference is aesthetic. Even though this is a needle and this is an axe, they do the same thing, only varying in attack power. There's nothing unique about any of the weapons in this chapter, and that wouldn't be too much of an issue if they didn't market it that way. Anyways, back to the fetch quest, I guess. Next up is... Where we have to stab these guys to get their... They also are really loud for some reason, but anyways, you have to stab them to collect their ink, but they are sensitive to sound. This mechanic is dumb. It feels very random to if you will or won't be able to sneak up on them. I don't think there's much strategy other than not running and just praying that they won't leave for no reason when you're walking up to them, but once you get the f It's back to Alice once again. Time for level P. This time you get a plunger as a weapon. A goddamn plunger. Why? You're turning valves with your hands, couldn't you have just given me the axe, you angel bitch? Anyways, as I said, you have to turn valves to line up the ink with the lines. You can't choose which way you turn the valve, so if it's just one below the line, but it's going the wrong way. You have to make it go all the way to the top or the bottom so it starts going the other way. This is not fun. It's not even a puzzle, it's just pressing a button over and over again until it's correctly placed. Once you're through that pain, you go back to Alice yet again, and it's time to go back to level K again. 
Wait, again we have to go through this section a third time? Great job on extending the runtime of the chapter, I guess. This time we have to destroy Bendy cutouts because Alice wants to pull an epic prank on Bendy and upload it to her vlog channel. We have to go all the way back to almost the beginning of the chapter to do this, which once again is not fun. This is just walking while occasionally breaking Bendy cutouts in areas that we've already seen. Then once you break the final one, there's a scripted Bendy spawn. Wow. Now, if you've played Bendy before, you might be wondering why I've neglected to mention the fact that Bendy spawns while you're completing tasks. This is because he serves such little purpose that he's barely worth mentioning. He can barely be considered a threat at all. He is more of an obstacle, if anything. It's always the same. You hear sudden heartbeats and you see ink textures on the wall. This signals you to go into one of the miracle stations. And these are pretty much everywhere, so it's not much of a challenge to enter one unless he spawns like right on your ass or something. Even if Bendy sees you, once you enter a miracle station, he instantly forgets you exist. I guess he lacks object permanence. And then you have to wait, and wait, for him to waltz back into a spot in the room where he will sink into a wall. This could maybe be effective, like, the first time it happens, but once it happens three or four times, you're just sitting there waiting for him to leave the room so you can continue whatever fetch quest you were doing. Not very fun waiting in a box for an extended period of time, just watching someone walk away, especially when it's so slow. Anyways, once again, back to the fetch quests. You wait for the scripted Bendy spawn to end, and then you walk all the way back to the elevator again. This is honestly probably the worst fetch quest due to how tedious it is. It's just walking back through an area you've already gone through two other times. The only difference is that you're breaking things. Once you get back to Alice, you're thrown into a fight with the Butcher Gang, the people we've already been beating up this entire chapter. This section is just more bad combat, so nothing new, but it's still just as annoying. But hey, at least once you're done beating those guys up, Alice gives you a gun. Just kidding, you get to keep the pipe. Wait, why did she take away her axe earlier? The pipe isn't even a tool, it was just a makeshift weapon that Boris found. Do you want me to get your stuff, dude? Regardless, we descend to level 14, and here we have maybe one of the best of these fetch quests because it has some actual danger. Not much of it, but this guy's here. He functions very similarly to Bendy having audio that lets you know he's near, and if he sees you, he'll chase you until you either die or get in a miracle station. I think the only difference is that the projectionist, which is his name by the way, is slightly slower than Bendy, and has to hit you twice to kill, and he can actually be killed. But don't even try with the pipe because it takes 72 hits to take him down. The only way to kill him without hitting him 72 times is to either get this axe by opening this door, before you get back the jump pipe, or, you turn this ink blob from the beginning of the chapter into an ink machine, go down the devil route, and don't die throughout all the fetch quests which allows you to actually get the gun. How the hell people found this out is beyond me. But in my opinion, killing the projectionist just makes this section absurdly boring. However, leaving the projectionist around just makes this section tedious. The projectionist isn't much of a threat, but every time you pick up one of the hearts he runs towards you, so you have to constantly stay in the stations waiting for him to slowly walk away. But admittedly, I like his design, and he adds a lot of atmosphere to the location because you can hear him wandering the halls in the distance. But generally, the section is just not well designed. It's very confusing to navigate and find the hearts you're looking for, since they're small and colored the same as the inky ground. But eventually, once you find all the hearts, you go back to Alice one last time, and you get to finally go home. Just kidding, who was fooled by this fake out? We're only halfway done with the game. Anyways, we fall way longer than we should, like how tall is this damn building, until we crash at the bottom where we get this hilarious cutscene and the chapter finally ends. This chapter is easily the worst gameplay wise, it's just more fetch quests, boring cutscenes and waiting around. While I think future chapters also have huge issues, they aren't nearly as long or tedious as this one. There are far stupider story beats, characters, and cutscenes, but good god this chapter is such a slog. This is undeniably the chapter I would least like to replay. With that done, we're officially over halfway done with the game, so let's get this over with. Up next is Chapter 4. Chapter 4 begins where the last one left off, at the bottom of the elevator. Your first task is to open this door, so get this valve in this hell room, which is admittedly kind of neat. I like this tape. It reminds me of how I sound when I'm playing Chapter 3. You then open the door and find a room full of ink people, and this is honestly a pretty strong start to the chapter. I really like to complain about this game. So it's saying a lot that these first few rooms of Chapter 4 are actually meeting my expectations for once. It sets up some interesting questions, and the setting looks pretty good. 
Moving into this library, we have to push in books, which isn't the most interesting thing, but it's less tedious than a lot of other things in this game, so I can't hate it too much. This funky thing happens, and I actually really like this idea, and it's a shame it was only here for this chapter, and it was never explained. It could have been really neat. Then we move into this room, and my biggest issues with this chapter come forth. This game thrives on claustrophobic enclosed environments, but this is a goddamn cave. Why is this in an animation studio? Moving on, we need to get a gear here, so we need to find a gear, or so you would think. We get a blob of ink from these guys who I guess are just cool with us now, and we put it in this machine to make gear out of ink. <sighs> Why the hell are they making cartoons that can create solid matter by just shoving ink blobs into this machine? This is it. We found it. The dumbest thing in this game. Why did they feel the need to add this thing? It creates so many questions with none of the answers. I know this seems like an overreaction, but it's so... So dumb. Anyways, moving on, we need to cross this ridge. Guess we can't just stand in the cart, though. We need to slide in. Then we have a fake out where you think the pulley might fall, but it does not. Slide out of there and go into the hallway. This scene is honestly really cool looking, and it's pretty scary the first time you see it. Again, I just wish these flashes were explained or used in more chapters. It's such a weird thing to introduce in the second to last chapter. Oh, there's the ink machine to remind us that it is bendy in the ink machine. Thank you, game. Hope you like stairs! Alice says she's gonna do shit to Boris, so I guess we gotta save him. We see this man walking across here crying, me too, and we enter this room which for some reason terribly lags the game. I don't know what causes this. I can run Doom Eternal with max settings and ray tracing while in a Discord call, but I guess the ink men are more intensive. Moving past this for some reason laggy room, we go into the vents. Like I said before, these are boring, it's just holding W until you get out. Oh yeah, and there's an extremely predictable and not scary jump scare. I wonder if this vent that's the only one that has a room visible through it is gonna be important. Also, you're telling me Bendy can do this to a metal door but can't rip these grates off? Hell, you're telling me he can't break through a couple of boards? Or a wooden door with one plank on it? The power scaling of Bendy is just not consistent at all. Once we exit the vent and avoid any Among Us jokes, we come to this very weirdly shaped room. Going up into this large Bendy head, we enter a room with a model of a theme park. I already mentioned this, but why exactly is this in a giant bendy head and up a bunch of stairs? Must be a bitch to climb up to work every day. Anyways, we flip this lever and go back down to the door next to the vent. We see lights turn on and we descend into the warehouse. This is actually a somewhat neat room, I just wish something happened in it. It just functions as a hub world to connect a bunch of small challenges. Speaking of, these make no sense. How does winning this game open this door? Honestly, that's a nitpick. I don't really mind the minigames here, even if the throwing mechanics here are less than stellar. At least the shooting minigame is okay. Anyways, going into this room, we come across some genuinely well-designed creepy mascot costumes. It's a shame these weren't used at all! Moving on, we go into this room, and oh boy, it's them again. We now get introduced to the mechanic of throwing cans. This is very clunky, and the mechanics for luring the enemies away from you are not very well done. It's very inconsistent and annoying to pull off correctly. Luckily, they don't know how to climb stairs and have no object permanence. Once we get past their buggy AI, we move into this room where we can pull a lever. There's an animatronic bendy on this table that does nothing despite being set up as something akin to a weeping angel. Why bring so much attention to this thing if it's just a prop? Anyways, we leave, distract them again so we can pull another lever. Now you might ask, why did we need to pull both of these? Uh, moving on, we enter the third room in this warehouse and we find a boss fight. Now, I'm not against boss fights in horror games, however, this is not done in a way that's scary. Take something like Little Nightmares, for example. This is the first boss fight of the game, but it's still scary because of how much danger you're in, and the fact that you're being forced to defend yourself with just your surroundings. It keeps the tension high and the player on the defensive. In contrast, this boss fight is initiated by Henry, which makes the player seem stronger. This would be good in an action game, but in a horror game, making the player feel like they could be killed by anything, even if they fight back, is a huge part in making a horror game have tension. The fight itself isn't great either, you just wait until it slams its arms down and then you break the wheels on the side. Repeat about 8 times, give or take, depending on how lucky you are where it decides to slam its arms down. It isn't dangerous, nor is it fun. Once we kill it, we flip this lever and have to enter the final room in the warehouse. Here we meet the projectionist again. How did he get from here to here? Unclear. We flip this switch and a scripted chase begins. We go up here, pull this lever, and the power goes out. The projectionist disappears, which makes no sense, but I'll let it slide because it's kind of neat. Going back up the stairs, we get a scripted chase again. Slide into the station, which is a not-so-subtle transition into a cutscene. We see Bendy beat the shit out of the projectionist until he rips its head off and drags its body away. Why he didn't also kill us is unclear, and why he stole the projectionist's body is also unclear. 
Considering his throne in Chapter 5, it would have made sense if he stole his head, but nope, he just leaves it on the ground because this game loves its continuity. Moving on, we open this giant door, which is what the levers we have been pulling have been activating. Going into it, we're greeted with an on-rails ride like you would find in a theme park, and we hop in. Hope you like listening to dialogue without any good or interesting visuals. Once we slog through that, we reach this giant room. We circle around it and are greeted with our old pal Boris. Oh no, they turned him into a monster, my only friend who stood in an elevator for the majority of this chapter, no! Anyways, he throws us back and the boss fight begins. The main mechanic of this fight is making pipes. Again, no, to attack Boris when he's stunned. This isn't the worst boss fight, but the Boris AI isn't great and his attacks aren't telegraphed well, especially when he starts jumping. But this actually does add tension even if it's unintended. I still hate this machine, but whatever. Once we hit Boris a final time, he dies slowly as the camera pans over and we're meant to feel bad about it. Turning around, we see Alice screaming and running at us. What exactly is her plan here? To strangle us? But before we get to see her plan, she gets stabbed and dies also. But who stabbed her? Another Alice who we have never seen before. And that's the end of that chapter. This was definitely a slight step up from 3, but I really wish it controlled better. It feels so clunky to do almost anything in this game due to how the controls aren't meant for the bigger scale stuff. But that's all for chapter 4. We're almost done. Only one chapter remains. Chapter 5 begins with us being locked in a cage. This is a very long cutscene where we can do nothing but sometimes look around. This establishes that Boris, or Tom, is an asshole, and Alice is annoying. Once they leave us to die, we break out by finding a pipe in a hidden toilet. What? Why is the toilet behind a hidden wall? Also, we find it by using this new mechanic introduced to us in the long cutscene. This mechanic is almost completely useless going forward. Moving along, we find a boat dock, and we can see the assholes who left us leaving, so we follow them. We go into this tunnel of ink and begin vrooming through it with terrifyingly low visibility. We see the boat they took docked, and then it's completely destroyed by a large hand. Rather than exiting the boat and getting the hell out of the Ink River as soon as possible, we continue down the tunnels like a rational person. Here we have the task of moving forward, stopping, slapping some ink, and repeating that until we exit while running away from the large hand. This isn't horribly done, but it is very repetitive. Moving on, we reach a small town and dock our boat. Why is this under an animation studio? Moving out of the boat, we did... Was that really necessary? Anyways, moving into the village, we walk forward, and then we encounter Sammy again, who looks the exact same as last time, despite being seemingly murdered. He tries to kill us, and oh god, this boss fight is so annoying. Sammy just runs at you, so you just have to run in circles until you get enough distance to attack him, and then you continue that cycle. It's genuinely awful, one of the worst fights in the game. Finally, we reach the end, where he grabs us and a cutscene plays. Tom lodges an axe in his head, because sure, and then he gives us the axe. What has changed in the last 16 minutes? He left us to die, and is now saving us? This isn't character development, this is character inconsistency. Then, right after that, we enter yet another fight, this time with a giant horde of ink people and ink creatures. This goes on for way too long. Once we finally finish with that slog of a fight, we move into this hallway. Oh man, I sure do hope none of these planks break, especially after they tell me to go first. Oh no! After somehow surviving this fall, we enter this reception area. We can see that we need pipes to drain this room full of ink. How did this happen? To get the pipes, we need blobs of ink to put into the- It's the goddamn machine again! <clears throat> we need ink to put into the machine to make the pipes we need. To get the ink, we have to go through this maze-like area with these guys from before roaming the place. This area is really annoying and would be next to impossible if you couldn't just outrun these guys. You have to go back and forth to the same place three times until you can finally get all the pipes to drain the room. What's really weird about it is that there's other locations where it looks like ink could spawn, but they're just not used, so I don't know what changed. Anyways, going into the room, we find a closed door, and then our allies meet up with us again. No idea how they got down here, but alright, they vaguely explain it with rope. It pays to carry a rope. The game tells a joke about how many fetch quests there are. Need three gears, a crowbar, some kind of counterbalance. Great, it's self-aware of how annoying they are. Acknowledging an annoying thing while still doing said annoying thing does not make it okay. We walk into this room, which is meant to mirror chapter one for some reason. We even get a line from chapter one here. This ends up meaning nothing in case you haven't already guessed. Moving forward, we see our inky boy once again before entering this room with a massive ink machine to remind us that this is indeed Bendy and the Ink Machine. 
Alice too tells us that they can't step in the ink, so she has to leave us. Great, I feel really sad leaving them. Great characters, glad they were introduced. We sludged through the ink on one of my playthroughs. I fell into this hole and couldn't get out, so I had to exit. And I found out that I hadn't saved my progress since chapter 4, so that's cool. Anyways, going into this place, we walk through a hallway until we reach a throne room. We get a cutscene explaining the item we'll use to end the game. Cool MacGuffin, I guess. Bendy appears after the cutscene because he wanted to be polite and wait to kill us. What a nice man. Then he morphs into this. It is taking all of my energy to not talk about how stupid this is, but I'll wait until the character section for that. Bendy picks us up and slams us through this wall, which looks really weird. Then we enter the final battle of the game. This boss, like most of the boss battles in this game, is really annoying and isn't well designed in the slightest. His only attack, if you can even call it that, is just running down these hallways, and the only thing you have to do to dodge them is just not be in his path. While avoiding him, you have to find and pull four levers to open four doors. Wow, I'm glad they're really using our skills we have learned throughout the game of going to a place and clicking something. The sheer amount of fetch quests was actually preparing us for this moment. This is the only place where the glass from the beginning of the chapter is actually useful, and even then it doesn't do a great job. Once we finally pull all the levers and go into this room, we have to trick Bendy into slamming into these tanks of ink. This part feels like 90% luck, and it's not programmed well. Bendy sometimes just doesn't break it, and other times he just stands right next to it, not killing you for some reason. But once that's done, the lights go out for some reason, and Bendy pulls a projectionist and disappears. This door opens and we must go back to the throne room to put the end tape in the projector. Once that's done, Bendy is behind us and he gets killed because the tape said it was the end. I will come back to this in the story section. Once we get blinded, we're sent to Joey Drew's house. I actually do like the contrast here compared to the rest of the game. It's jarring, but in a good way. We walk up to Joey and he shows us to the studio, which is a gif of chapter one's opening. Couldn't just take the model from chapter one? No? Alright. And thus ends Bendy and the Ink Machine. So if you couldn't tell, Chapter 5 is bad. Like, really bad. There's so many sections of pure filler, and just the most stupid story beats along the way as well. It's hard to land an ending, but this somehow managed to not only trip and fall, but also break every bone in its body. I'll discuss that more in the story section. Before we move on, I had a thought while writing this. What would happen if we cut all the fetch quests out of the gameplay? Everything that isn't strictly necessary to the plot will be cut. So in the first chapter, let's assume that when you get to the ink machine switch, it's already ready to turn on, and the studio immediately collapses. Also remove the draining ink. In chapter 2, let's cut out the switches and assume that Sammy just knocks us out right away so we don't have to deal with the super long fetch quest that goes nowhere. The rest of the chapter stays. In chapter 3, we cut out the soup cans and let's just cut all the fetch quests from Alice. In chapter 4, we cut out the small one at the beginning, the books, and the broken gear. We can cut the can room and the mini games from this, but it'll be nice and let the boss fight and the projectionist stay. In chapter 5, while this isn't technically a fetch quest, let's cut the long fight after the Sammy one, as it serves a similar purpose of just padding the game time. We also cut the ink pipe gathering, obviously. In this final fight, let's assume there aren't any levers to pull and we just need to make it to the door to leave. And with all that, let's see how much of this game is truly filler. So after cutting everything, a full playthrough of Bendy with no filler is just under 58 minutes long. This entire playthrough took roughly 2 hours, so over half of my playthrough was fetch quests. Also, the first two chapters were over in about 7 minutes. If you want to see the raw footage of the no filler playthrough, I left a link in the description to do the entire thing. Also, sorry about the audio cutting, I don't know why the recording did that, but I'm not playing through Bendy again to re-record the footage. The gameplay of Bendy is easily the most flawed aspect of the game. It suffers from bad controls, an insane amount of fetch quests, and is generally just not fun to play. I think with better controls and some fixing of the base mechanics, Bendy could have at least been a fun game, but unfortunately this isn't the only problem. The characters suffer also. The characters in Bendy are also very flawed. Even the best characters aren't without issues, so let's go character by character in order of appearance throughout the chapters as I discuss what flaws they have and the missed potential of their characters. I'm also going to discuss the design changes they all got throughout the game's chapters releasing and the issues with those and their originals. Let's get to it, starting with... Alright Joey, I'm here. 
Let's see if we can find what you wanted me to see. Henry is the protagonist of Bendy and the Ink Machine, and despite being an almost blank slate for the player to see through, he still somehow manages to have some very big problems with him. Henry is the co-founder of Joey Drew Studios, and he left the company after something between him and the other founder Joey Drew happened. Not much is said about this breakup other than it sure did happen. 30 years later, he gets invited back to the studio by Joey Drew, which is what leads to the game's beginning. This is about all we know about him, and I wouldn't complain too much about the lack of detail if Henry's backstory and purpose wasn't so prevalent to the story. Henry is questioned on multiple occasions about who he is and what he's doing here, what his purpose was, what his motivations are. Who are you? You're here for a reason, Henry. You look familiar to me. That face. Here. We're all dying to find out. And I don't even know what I'm doing here. I don't even know why this is all happening to me. All of which go unanswered by the end of the game. It's set up to be like some sort of reveal, but it's never paid off. It baffles me that they were setting this up at the end of chapter 4 and 5, but it still went nowhere. Like they were at the end of the game, why set it up if you had no payoff planned? This would have been fine if it was left out, a silent protagonist doesn't always need a backstory, all of the exposition we needed was in the first letter, but then they add these things that go nowhere, so it makes the character feel more empty and underdeveloped. But this isn't the only baffling thing about Henry. I think the worst part of him is that he's a silent protagonist that, for some reason, isn't always silent. Worse than that, he probably didn't need dialogue at all, but they are still here for some reason. Henry gets scared by a cutout, Who put this here? then doesn't react to the building collapsing around him. He'll say nothing when Alice is stabbed right in front of him, but he'll talk about his old desk. Hey, here's my old desk. It makes no sense. It takes more effort to add voice lines, but they all distract from the atmosphere. Either have him talking and react to everything, or have him shut up. It's not that hard, guys. That's about it for Henry, though. He obviously has no designs. I dislike him a lot, which is a true accomplishment for being an almost silent person who has no personality other than being really scared of cardboard. Bendy himself is a very boring villain from my point of view. He has an okay design, but he doesn't have any substance or even a huge presence in the game as a whole. I mean, outside of a cutscene here or there, he only actually appears in three of the five chapters as a threat to the player, and in two of those it's just for the very end of the chapter. I understand wanting to focus on other characters, but when the main villain of your horror game has less screen time than these guys, you might have a problem. Outside of that, he doesn't really have a backstory in the game, which is honestly disappointing. I know there's some lore and hints towards the reason why he's alive, but in the game itself it isn't explored much. We aren't told or shown how he's like that. We don't know why they are living in creatures in the first place other than the vague idea that Joey Drew was trying to do it, and we don't know why Bendy is evil. His character is barely explored, and it's unfortunate because from the very limited amount of things we actually do know about him, it's pretty interesting. It just feels underdeveloped and not fleshed out nearly enough. Let's take a look at his design evolution. His first appearance debuted in the original Chapter 1. He appears as this very large ink blob thing with no arms and no legs. It's okay, I like how large it is, but all it did was poke its head up and look at you. The design is hard to critique, so that's it for that. It didn't stay for long, so I won't complain much about it either. His second design was introduced in Chapter 2. It was much more human, and a lot of people like this a lot. I think it's pretty alright, although his small hand is kind of weird. I hear some people say it looks more scary than other designs because he's trying to look human but failing. While I agree to an extent, I think it could have looked better. Maybe pushing his wobbling and making it look like he's about to fall apart would be good. His final main design was introduced in Chapter 4. I think it's pretty strong, actually. I like his textures, and if it was in a context outside of this game, it would have been quite a scary character. I like the starving animal look he has. Although it might have been pushed a bit far with his spine poking out. Maybe if it was dialed down a bit, I think it would be good. I think a fusion between this and him trying to look human like the last design would be the ideal Bendy, but for now this is actually pretty good. But of course I can't go too long without bitching, can I? In Chapter 5 he transforms from his main design into what people have dubbed Beast Bendy, and holy hell, this design sucks. He looks way more goofy than anything, it comes across as if they were trying way too hard to make him look scary, but failed to understand what makes his original design scary in the first place. His normal design worked because he was a twisted form of a cartoon character, 
This is just a generic monster. His only resemblance to the cartoon design is the holes in his hands, which, coincidentally, is also the only thing I like about his design. His proportions are awful, his legs look way too small, and it makes it look quite dumb. His hands are way too big, his body is a V-shape, and his head in general is a complete downgrade from his smaller counterpart. Why make his horns soft ink tendrils rather than big, sharp, threatening-looking horns? Why remove all of his face and only leave the mouth? Why give him tiny, sharp teeth? It just looks bad. It's not threatening, and the design pales in comparison to his normal design. I think if they went with a more freeform ink monster blob or something of that sort, it would have looked much better. Or even just making him more animal-like would have been a good direction to push him. Apart from that design, though, there isn't much to discuss with Bendy. As I said, he's quite boring lore-wise, and he doesn't have much of a character other than a guy who kills you. So we're going to move on to the next character. There we go now. We wouldn't want our sheep roaming away now, would we? No, we wouldn't. Sammy is the first character here with an actual personality and somewhat of a story. He was a music writer in Joey Juice Studios until he went insane by drinking ink. A delicious treat. It's also revealed to be a bit of a dick to his fellow co-workers. It's also implied that he knew Henry, but it's not really an important detail. We were introduced to Sammy from him walking down a hall and then teleporting away. Don't worry, this never comes up again. Then he smacks us and tries to sacrifice us to Bendy. I will say I like his voice acting, although it's slightly over the top. He then seemingly dies because Bendy kills him instead. If that was all to Sammy, I would actually think he's a pretty good one-off character, but unfortunately they brought him back in Chapter 5. He doesn't have any story significance here other than just being a boss fight, which like I said in the gameplay section is easily the worst one in the game. He's also visually completely unchanged from how we last saw him despite him seemingly being killed. Really couldn't have updated his model a bit? Make his clothes dirtier? Change anything at all? No? Alright. Moving on, we knock his mask off before he grabs us, and wow, what a reveal, his face is very underwhelming. His face is just featureless. This is extra weird to me, because in the credits of Bendy, we get this really good illustration of Sammy without a mask, and this is a great design! If this is what we saw, a twisted face with hollow eyes and a gaping mouth, that would have been awesome, and would at least somewhat justify his inclusion here, but no! I can't help but think this was due to time constraints, but knowing how lazy the devs are, it could just be that they couldn't be bothered to change his model at all. Moving on, he threatens to cut our head off, and I'm gonna pause here for a second again. I really prefer his Chapter 2 performance, no disrespect to the voice actor, I'm sure this is due to how he was directed, but his voice is much less threatening and it barely resembles Sammy's voice from Chapter 2. Maybe again if his design was updated along with the voice it could have worked better, but as is it just doesn't work for me. Okay, after he's about to kill us, he gets an axe to his head instead, and thus ends Sammy's role in Chapter 5. He serves no purpose outside of giving Tom a chance to redeem himself, and I'll talk more about why this moment is stupid when I'm discussing Tom's character. Oh, I'll get to you. But even that could have been done in a number of different ways. This kind of ruins Sammy for me, honestly. He was interesting because he was only attacking you so he could sacrifice you to Bendy, but now he's just gonna kill you himself, I guess. Maybe if his character was explored more it could have worked, but as is, it's just very underdeveloped. Next I'll discuss his two design iterations. Less than Bendy, but something I really want to touch on. He debuted originally in Chapter 2 with this model, which is much different from his final design. He's much thinner, he's lanky, his skin is rough, and his overalls are way too big for his small stature. And this design is much better than his redesign in Chapter 4. It has way more character. He's a music writer, not a lumberjack. You get the impression that if given the chance, you could easily take him out yourself, but he's outsmarted you by catching you off guard. His design is so much more interesting, and it fits his character so well, so why did they have to go and change it to this? This redesign is the worst of any design change any other character has had. Why does he have ink abs? Why is he so muscular? Why is he smooth and shiny? He lost all of his personality in his design, and he's just a far worse character because of it. Design is important in characters, and this is a clear example of the creators misunderstanding Sammy's character. The only positive that came with this design is that he got improved animations, but imagine how good it could have been with this model. Sammy didn't need updating, but they did it anyways. If you wanted to update his model to be better, then don't redesign him, just make what already worked look better. God, this design change annoys me. Boris's main character trait is that he doesn't kill you. That's about all the depth he has. We know he's nice to Henry, he's scared of Bendy in the dark for some reason, and he's some sort of mechanic. He's a silent character so we don't get much out of him. He helps you once or twice in Chapter 3, sits in an elevator, then gets taken by Alice. The main story relevance he has is that he's meant to be our motivation in Chapter 4. Or perhaps you're just looking for a little friendly wolf. 
We need to find him because he got taken by Alice, as I said before. He then gets turned into a monster and we kill him. He honestly doesn't even have that much story relevance. He could probably be taken out of the game completely without many issues. But he's a cute companion, so I don't mind him being here that much. I will say that there is some missed potential here with his character. Alice in Chapter 3 says that he's the perfect Boris, but how does she know this? I don't know, he looks about the same as the 20 other ones she has. It's never really explored and neither is the part where he sees a bunch of dead versions of him. It could have been some neat character development if this was brought up again, but alas, it was not. Unfortunately, all the interesting character he could have had isn't used and he remains as a cute but very surface level character. Honestly, there's not much more to discuss, so let's move on to the character design evolution, starting with the original release of Chapter 1. Let's take a look- GOOD GOD! This model is awful! There isn't much to say about this, so let's get out of here as fast as possible. Ugh, much better. This model is actually pretty good. Much more lovable. I like the face shape a lot, and I'm glad they didn't change his design drastically like some of the other characters, because they pretty much nailed it on this one. There are some minor tweaks throughout the rest of the chapters, but nothing really worth talking about separately, so let's move on to the big boy. Brute Boris, as he's called, is a giant monster version of Boris, and I do have some problems with him, but not nearly as much as Beast Bendy. It's implied that Alice made Brute Boris with the stuff that you collected in the last chapter, but visually he doesn't really share that much with the stuff you've collected. Sure, he's bloated, so there's probably some of that in there, but not much else. I would have liked to see him as more of a mechanical thing with gears or something. I don't hate this design or anything, I like the rib cage and the pipe sticking out of the body. I would have liked to see a bit more changes on the head, maybe making it deformed would be neat. I also think he could have been animated more like a monster, make him look more unhinged like Hulk or something. His walk animation doesn't really have that much personality. Maybe even making it look like he's fighting against himself. Imagine if instead of getting tired and spurting ink, he instead ripped out his own ink trying to hurt himself to protect you. Similar to something like the Hollow Knight. Again, I don't hate this, but there was some wasted potential here. It could have been much more impactful and these changes could have made his death actually sad. Speaking of which, his death is dumb. We were only with him for a chapter, and even then most of the time he was sitting in an elevator, so I feel like this moment is undeserved. Regardless, that's it for Boris, so let's move on to the next character. Do I kill you? Do I tear you apart to my heart's delight? The choices of the beautiful are unbearable. Alice is a character introduced early on in Chapter 3 and functions as the main plot mover in both Chapter 3 and 4. She's evil, but doesn't try and directly kill you. She mostly uses you and forces you to do stuff for her. I do like her voice acting. I think the actor does a pretty good job with her character, even if some of the writing is weird. I also think her introduction, at least for the first part, is really well done. Entering a room with her face everywhere and her singing until she reveals her monster form is really cool. The only thing is that I wish her speech was animated because I think the dialogue is pretty good here. I just wish it wasn't on a black screen. She probably has the most in-game lore and backstory out of every character in the game. There are a ton of tapes with her on them, and honestly, I kind of like her story. She was a voice actor for background characters, then got a starring role as Alice, and she thought it would be her big breakthrough that she was replaced by another actor for seemingly no reason. It's simple, but definitely the best backstory in this game. Apart from that, she talks to Henry a lot through the chapter to give exposition or just for world building, and it's done alright. I wish she had more of a presence physically in the chapter. We don't see her at all apart from her introduction in this very boring exposition dump, which is a shame considering her character design is pretty good as well. I like her melted face and the ink gloves and her halo which is coming out of her head. It's all pretty damn good. But I can't go too long without bitching, so here I go. After chapter 3, she steals Boris and isn't seen for the entire chapter until it's ending. She then gets stabbed after running at you for no reason. Great send-off, guys. Her death is easily the most unsatisfying thing about her character. She is just killed off by someone we've never met before, and for no reason other than they wanted her out of the story, I guess. There could have been much more impact behind her death, and it's wildly disappointing that she gets killed off just to be replaced with a much less interesting character that we only get to see in the beginning of Chapter 5. A huge waste, but that's all for Alice, so let's move on to the next character. <sighs> I guess this is a, technically a character, but I thought I'd touch on them briefly. I don't have too much to say, but they appear so much I feel like I should. I think the concept of them is pretty neat. I like the idea of these side characters being enemies, and it's a welcome departure from the ink blobs. But I do think they're extremely overused. I would have loved to see more enemies in a similar vein to these guys, because we encounter them so much. But I think some of the design aspects are a little goofy, like the fishing rod head is a bit much for me. But overall, I think they're designed alright. But it kind of feels like they were only meant to appear in Chapter 3, like we have the final battle with them and it's implied that they die, but then they're back in future chapters like nothing happened. It's not a huge deal, but it would have been nice to have some more variety in the characters. Even making variations of them would have been neat, that way we can tell they're copies of each other. 
Maybe make the ones we kill at the end of chapter 3 the perfect ones, and as the chapters go on, they get more and more messed up. Something like that would bring so much more life to these characters, but whatever, these guys aren't really important. The projectionist was introduced at the end of chapter 3. He walks around, and when his light shines on you, he chases you. He's basically a reskinned Bendy, except he never despawns. He's honestly pretty annoying to deal with in Chapter 3, but not horrible because he's so easy to hear coming due to how loud his projector is. Gameplay-wise, he's pretty boring. He comes back in Chapter 4 for a brief chase with the player and a cutscene where his head gets ripped off, which sounds cooler than it is, honestly. He doesn't bring too much to the table in terms of gameplay. However, I will say that his design is one of the best in the game. The projector on in the head and the wires coming out of the back and going back into his body, the speaker on the front and his sound design is honestly one of the best in the game. It takes a character that would be pretty boring and it makes him surprisingly memorable. I even dressed up for him as Halloween when I still liked this dumpster fire. Now that doesn't excuse his lackluster gameplay, but the design is good. When the whole cast got redesigned, his was probably the least affected, although I think I prefer his original look rather than the smooth, inky body, but this is not much worse than the other one. I do wish he had more to do. His lore is pretty simple and he doesn't do much other than serve as a passive enemy before being killed off. I think he could have had some real potential as a bigger threat to the player, but nevertheless I do think he is okay overall. Not great, but he's safe from being bad by his design. These funky men were introduced in Chapter 4, and I think they are boring. They just kind of stand there and don't really have any reason to exist. I don't hate them, and there is a moment where I was like, oh man, that's kind of spooky, and it's when you turn around in the vent and they're watching you. That's kind of neat. Design-wise, they're pretty bland to be honest, just inky men. I like the glowing eyes, but honestly, it's pretty nothing. This concept art looks much more interesting than when we got, and it makes me sad to see how it turned out. I just wish they did a bit more generally. Like, they have potential, but aren't utilized almost at all. They also appear in Chapter 5 as enemies for this really long battle I talked about, which, like I said in the gameplay section, is very tedious, so it's far from a great use for them, but that's about it for these guys. Bertram is a really weird character. I like the idea of an insane person designing a theme park, I think that has potential, but I really wish it had more build-up or wasn't as... stupid. He's introduced only at most a half an hour before you see him in his monster form. I think he could have used more build-up as a character. Design-wise, I think he looks dumb as well. His giant fuck-off head just floating in the middle isn't scary, and other than that, it's pretty much just a normal carnival ride. Maybe if they suspended him in the machinery or something with his whole body in the center, it would have been neat, but as is, it just looks dumb. In the initial concept art, he looks a lot more disheveled as well, and I think that could have at least added a little bit more flavor to his design. Overall, I think this is a waste of an interesting concept, like most of the other things in this game. But there isn't much more to talk about, so let's move on. I honestly don't know my name. So, they call me Alice. But I'm no angel. Okay, this goddamn character pisses me off so much. She serves nearly no function in the story and just comes in in the last chapter while killing off one of the most interesting characters. She just does nothing. She introduces this mechanic which is almost completely useless, and she provides some lore, I guess? We are barely even accompanied by her. She disappears after the opening cutscene and she reappears to fight the people. We fall down a hole leaving her behind, she finds us again, and then we have to leave her to go fight the final boss. What was even the point of this? Maybe it could have worked if Alice and Allison actually met and had a thing going on, but no, she just fucking stabs her. She serves no purpose and is just a bad character. The only redeeming quality is that she has ties to Alice Angel's lore, with Allison being presumably the person who replaced the original Alice for the voice acting role of the cartoon, but it's never explored properly. In fact, to my knowledge, it's never even technically confirmed in-game that she is the voice actor who replaced the original Alice. Regardless, even if that sounds interesting, it isn't used in any way in the game to make her character more developed. She's just kind of there. Design why she's fine, I guess? Nothing terrible. I like how she has her hair tied up and is visually distinct from Alice while still being recognizable as the same base character. I think her sword is kind of dumb. That handle is too long. I like her boots. I wish she had a bit more detail on her body or texture because her arms and legs are really flat and they look kind of plasticky. But yeah, that's about it for her. After Henry leaves, we never see her again, so I guess we just have to wait to see what happens to her in the sequel. Tom is honestly not as bad as Allison. I like the idea of taking Boris and making him a dick. He's just a complete asshole and I kinda like that. But he's only like that for the very opening cutscene and then he's just a normal guy so it's kind of a wasted idea unfortunately. 
I feel like Tom and even Allison had some potential in terms of story and character, but because they were introduced so late into the game, they didn't have nearly enough time to develop. It's honestly a shame. Design-wise, I actually quite like Tom's design. Maybe it's just because I'm a sucker for mechanical arms, but he's pretty alright in my book. Not much more to say about that. But yeah, this is just another unfortunate situation of wasted potential in the characters. I would have liked to see more of Tom, but alas, we did not. I certainly don't see why we need this machine. It's noisy, messy, and who needs that much ink anyway? The tapes are honestly not a bad idea in the slightest and adds a lot of character to the world without that much effort. I do wish they were a bit more important, and no I don't mean have someone mention keys in one, I mean make them more lore significant. They are definitely the best source of lore in the game, but I feel like they could be used to greater effect. They almost got there with the projectionist and how you can hear a tape from when he was still human, but I feel like that could have been pushed more further. I do like the voice acting for the most part in the tape, so I think the characters are alright. I particularly like the I'm guy because I also want to leave this game, but genuinely it's pretty neat. I do wish you could carry the tapes around with you because a lot of the time you just kind of have to sit there and listen to them, which is sort of boring. Overall, the tape people are pretty good, but it leaves a bit to be desired. Come visit the old workshop. There's something I need to show you. Joey Drew is one of the most underdeveloped and underutilized characters in the entirety of Bendy and the Ink Machine. There is nothing answered about them, he's not significant in the story, he's not even present in the gameplay, and he serves almost no purpose other than inviting Henry to the studio. The fact that they had the perfect chance to make him into Bendy, but didn't, makes me unreasonably upset. It's such an obvious direction for the game, and they didn't take it. It would have made so much sense, Joey is unhinged and experimenting with Ink, ripping open corpses of his characters, but he's just some old guy. He had so much potential. The idea of a passionate creator becoming corrupt and obsessed with bringing literal life to his creations is fantastic, like a twisted version of Walt Disney, and the idea of him becoming a monster through his corruption would have been such a good wrap up for his character, but the game just doesn't take it. So we're left with this guy who's just kind of a dick to people and experimented on some ink creatures. Hell, I'm half convinced they didn't do it just because people predicted it would happen. There's so many hints towards it, but the fact that they didn't go through it makes Joey and Bendy worse as characters, as well as leaving the story in an unsatisfying conclusion. Speaking of which... The story of Bendy and the Ink Machine was executed in a way which the game made the story seem like a big deal, and then they didn't tell that story the game was presenting. There's so much setup and build up and questions and hints towards answers, but there's nothing. Henry gets invited to the studio, he finds some ink monsters, he goes through trying to find a way out. There's barely anything deeper than that. There's some underlying lore about how some of the monsters used to be people, but nothing much deeper than that. Now, lack of story in a horror game isn't necessarily a bad thing. Take FNAF for example. And before you yell at me, hear me out, okay? The basic story of the game is that you're hired as a night guard and you have to survive five or six nights in a haunted pizzeria. That's it. But the difference is that FNAF doesn't put an emphasis on its story. It's just used as a device to explain why the player is in the situation that they're in. Now you could argue, doesn't Bendy do that? I mean on the surface level it is a very similar introduction, but I would argue no. While FNAF presents its story in a similar way, it doesn't try and make you think about it. The most it does is provide some exchanges with the phone guys. It doesn't draw attention to its story because it isn't trying to tell one in its gameplay, while Bendy on the other hand is constantly raising questions on its own to the player that we would expect to get answers to. And this starts as early as chapter one, one of the first dialogues we hear from Henry is this. Oh my god, Joey what were you doing? Similar things go on throughout the entire game, raising questions and trying to get us to think about a story when there isn't one. The most common one as you have seen is asking what Joey's deal is, but the other one, which makes me more angry, is the question of who Henry is, as I explored earlier. Raising these questions in-game makes the player rightfully expect them to be answered, but they never properly are. Hell, Henry could be anyone, he could be Joe from accounting and nothing would change in the story. It's like Bendy wanted to create theory bait or tell a story like FNAF, but didn't understand how to craft a story in the background, so shoved it into the main story without an actual plan to answer the questions being asked. I highly doubt that they had any actual plans for the story. They even admitted themselves that they were making the story up as they go, at least to some extent. Hell, Alice Angel wasn't even going to be a character originally, but they did it because fans liked her. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but it creates problems when you don't plan out your narrative-driven story game. And that's what Bendy comes off as, a story game without a story. But even ignoring the story, what does Bendy have? A crappy walking simulator with terrible combat and underdeveloped characters? 
No matter how much you enjoy the characters in Bendy, there is nothing to tie them together. You could cut almost everyone from the game and it would barely even change because none of them really matter in the story. Even Joey Drew barely factors into it. It just leaves the game hollow. When there's no answers to any questions, there's no purpose for these characters, there's no ending, there's just nothing. No matter how much you can shit on FNAF's story, at least it has solid gameplay backing it up. No matter how convoluted its lore gets, at its core, it's still enjoyable. But Bendy doesn't have that core gameplay, so when the story failed, the game also failed. With that being said, let's actually break down what the game presents and how the story progresses as you're going through the game, just to see how much actually matters. We open with the letter. This is important as it's what drives the player to the location. Good job, guys, you did it. During the first chapter, we collect six artifacts to put on these pedestals. A record, a plush, a gear, a wrench, a book, and a bottle of ink. All of this is pointless and these items have no significance to the story. Why are they needed to activate the ink machine? Hell if I know, man. We also see Boris who is being torn open on an operation table. This never comes back. We don't know why Joey was doing this to Boris, but he sure was. And no, this is not connected. This is done by Alice, and this is done by Joey. We can hear a tape by Wally Franks who talks about how cartoons aren't getting done on time anymore and there's ink everywhere. This is good world building and I don't hate it. Moving forward, we find the ink machine room blocked off. No reason as to why. We can also see human footprints leading to this room. There are never any answers as to who the hell this is. Moving on in the chapter, we find a room with a sacrifice circle, presumably made by Sammy. We then get these flashes of images, which I will award the worst case of pointless lore being added when it leads nowhere. Why is there a wheelchair? No one fucking knows. We then pass out and the chapter ends. Moving on to the next one, we get up and all we get is Ugg my head before moving on. We can hear Henry saying that he's wondering how the hell the place got so big, and this makes me wonder how early he left the company, considering the other shit present in the studio. Moving on, we have an audio log to introduce Sammy. There's a lot of worship talk, which plays into Sammy's character. Still don't really know why he was worshipping an ink demon, but go off, I guess. This is a decent introduction to his character. We continue on, and we see Sammy teleport away. This never comes back unless you count his sudden appearance to knock you out, but I do not. This is just spooky to be spooky. Honestly, there isn't much of note in this area. We get an early introduction to Alice, which is good. Again, I think the audio logs are alright to building the world, not that they're super interesting. Nothing else here really comes back in any way, but nothing that makes me mad or anything, it's just more tapes and such. So Sammy knocks us out, cool, and he tries to summon Bendy to kill us, to which Bendy kills him instead. Or so we thought, I guess, as he comes back in chapter 5. I discussed this earlier, but I don't think this was a good decision, and it means that this is yet another loose end to tie up. Why didn't Sammy die? During Chapter 3, the longest and most prevalent story beat that seemingly goes nowhere is you fetching items for her. You can make an argument that it's for Brute Boris, but like, most of the stuff you collect doesn't seem to correlate. Brute Boris isn't mechanical at all, so why do you need to get gears and power supplies? The other two I can understand, but half the stuff you collect never really comes back. Other than that, the chapter is just kind of a long distraction. There's some good stuff with Alice's story as I mentioned before, but the overall plot of the game itself isn't really developed here, other than throwing Henry further down into the studio, I guess. Chapter 4 has the self-contained story of Bertram, which like I said is fine, but underdeveloped. Then it also introduces lost ones which are never properly explored, we just fight them in Chapter 5 and they're apparently kept at bay by Sammy. Then there's the projectionist getting killed by Bendy, which once again doesn't go anywhere. We get more stuff asking about who Henry is, which also goes nowhere. Then Alice dies, presumably because they didn't know how to wrap up her character, and that's where the chapter story elements end. Chapter 5 introduces the Looking Glass, which does add some stuff, but it's kind of too little too late in my opinion. We get some characterization for Allison and Tom, who both go nowhere by the end of the game. I assume they'll be explored in Dark Revival, but who knows honestly. Still dumb to introduce them for basically no reason. Sammy returns just to die again, which as I mentioned earlier, I think is a dumb story beat that kind of retroactively ruins his character. And holy hell, this is the stupidest way that this game could have ended. Bendy turns into Beast Bendy, you run around, then play the reel, and Bendy dies. Then it's revealed that you're in a time loop of some sort. I don't like this ending. Huge surprise, I know, but I feel like this is just a cop-out, if anything. Nothing is properly explained, everything is left up to your interpretation. And while that works for some games, a story-driven action-adventure game is not one of them. The story was a huge drive for people, and this ending is so unsatisfying that it retroactively ruined a lot of Bendy. When you're replaying, you keep getting asked questions that you know won't be answered, so it all just feels not only unfinished, but like they never had a plan in the first place, and I wouldn't be surprised if they didn't. 
Originally, I thought the story section would be longer, but there's literally just not much to talk about. Nothing goes anywhere, and what we do get is so stupid that it's kind of self-explanatory. The game is so hollow in its story that it's legitimately hard to break down in detail. So, I think it's about time we begin wrapping up, so let's finally head into our last section of the video. With all that said and done, we enter our final part and begin to wind down, finally. I know that after 1 hour 19 minutes and 48 seconds of me complaining and nitpicking and hating on this game, I can see people wondering why. Why spend so much time on this game that you hate? Who cares if there's a bad game? Aren't there far worse games? There are far worse games, yes. In fact, the other game made by this team is easily worse than Bendy. So why do I care? Before I finally wrap up, I want to tell you why I care about this game. I didn't always hate this game. It was one of my main creative inspirations growing up. It's one of the few games which I made animations for. Very bad animations, but they helped me get better. I poured dozens of hours into the game and easily hundreds creating art around it. It used to be one of my favorite games of all time, but once it was done I just lost my love for it. And it hurt a bit, you know? I like to rag on this game, but it was undeniably a huge part of my life. I think that's why I care how bad it turned out in the end. Something I poured my passion to did not return that passion back. I know that it's not personal, of course, I'm not the single individual that they are making games for and I'm not entitled to it being good, but it is just kind of disappointing, you know? I think Bendy and the Ink Machine could have been one of the best indie horror games on the market, easily. I think if they capitalized on what made people like it in the first place and kept pumping actual effort into it, it could have been fantastic. The world they created is incredible conceptually. The idea of walking through a sketch is such a great idea, and setting it in a rundown animation studio? Really an idea is all around, but as time went on, I think they lost everything that made Bendy special. They catered towards kids more, without realizing the reason why kids liked it in the first place. They focused on action more than atmosphere, but more than all, they focused on money more than quality. It's legitimately sad to see such a good concept be wasted, and what makes it more painful is that the potential is there, and they came so close to grabbing it and being fantastic. Some of it was even good, not the game, but the first book. It actually leaned into the horror more, there's dead bodies being held in ink, people going insane, people actually turning into the ink creatures, and it told a story that touches on racism and the holocaust. It's insane to me that this book is in the same franchise as the game. It shows the potential Bendy has. It could tell mature stories in a universe with terrifying inky horrors, but it chooses to be anything but that. The book isn't perfect, but it's an example of what could have been had they not changed course with the game. Another issue I have is that they stifle those who try and take advantage of the idea of Bendy. They go hard on fan games and they're often taken down, so even if people want to take advantage of the ideas that Bendy had and make something actually good out of them, they can't. It just adds even more distaste to the whole idea of Bendy. I think it's incredibly unfortunate how such a good idea can be ruined by lack of care and letting the bare minimum work for the developers. I mean, hell, games can be updated, patched, visually improved after launch nowadays. I mean, and I can't believe that I'm using this as an example of what to do. But Security Breach at least made some effort in polishing the game after the backlash. Hell, Cyberpunk did that. But the Bendy devs abandoned it on release, they never released any patches after Chapter 5, never went back to fix the save glitch despite the creator knowing how to, and never bothered to even give the game a passing glance. Once it was out, it was dead in the water, destined to be bug-filled forever. I am aware that the dev team has said that they plan on fixing some of the issues after Dark Revival releases, but I highly doubt they will. They probably hope people have just moved on from Bendy and the Ink Machine at this point. You know, there's actually a lot of similarities between Bendy and Security Breach. Both took their franchises in a direction aimed towards kids, both were a mess on release, both of their stories are awful. I think some people might use that to justify liking Bendy, saying like, well, if you like FNAF and SB was bad, then what's the difference? But that difference is that Bendy and the Ink Machine is all the franchise has. Unless you really want to count Boris and the Dark Survival for some reason. Well, FNAF has a ton of entries, and while they may vary in quality, I mean, most FNAF fans at least dislike a couple of the games, they have other entries to enjoy. Well, Bendy and the Ink Machine is all there is until future projects expand the franchise. Speaking of future projects, Dark Revival is set to release tomorrow as of this video upload. Obviously, I'm skeptical of its quality. It's shown about two seconds of actual gameplay before release, so that's not a good sign in my books. But, despite what you might think, I legitimately hope the game is good. I'm rooting for a comeback in the Bendy franchise, because as much as I dislike Bendy and Link Machine, I don't think Bendy as a whole is without potential. But, if the creators still have the mindset they did with Bendy and Showdown, I don't think it'll be the savior of the Bendy franchise. But, we'll just have to see how it turns out. If it's good, I might even make a video about it showcasing how they listened to feedback and worked to make the game better. 
or alternatively i'll make a video about how it's bad but legitimately i'd love to be a fan of bendy again I mean, I used to be a massive one before I came to the realization that I strongly disliked the game. I followed his chapters releases since chapter 2 and got a ton of merch along the way. This was my bendy shell, and despite selling most of it over time, I still have two items that I don't think I'll ever get rid of. I got the opportunity to meet Mike Mood in person at PAX 2018 and got a signed mystery box from him. And inside, along with other things I don't have anymore, was this bendy plush. So despite all of this, Despite spending hundreds of hours writing and researching and plotting down everything I dislike about this game, I still can't help but hold some sort of fondness for it. So, I think with that we can finally draw this video to a close. If you're a Bendy fan and somehow made it this far, thank you for hearing me out. I don't think I'd be able to sit through a video this long dunking on a game that I liked. And remember, if you like Bendy, that's totally awesome. I'm glad you have a piece of media you can enjoy. Who knows, maybe with Dark Revival I'll be back on that Bendy train. Only time will tell. And you better believe I'll be playing it on release, so expect my first impressions soon. I hope whether you already had a dislike for Bendy or were even a fan, you enjoyed this breakdown. I've been writing this for well over a year and a half, and I've had this video in the conceptual stage as far back as 2020, so this was a pretty big project for me. I had a lot of fun making this, so I hope you had fun watching as well. Have a good night.